I'm Thomas Mann, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And I'm uh, Norm Ornstein, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and we are co-authors of the New York Times best-selling book, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of Extremism. I think I would uh, say the book is a, an attempt to provide a different interpretation of the widespread malaise about America's dysfunctional politics and to offer some suggested remedies to it. Uh, we believe uh, that most of the commentary uh, in the media and among pundits outside uh, bipartisan groups, uh, a lot of academics is, uh, is inaccurate. It doesn't really get to the heart of the problems we're facing. And ironically, uh, those misinterpretations serve, we think, to misinform and demobilize a public, uh, which, uh, which is the only force that can really ameliorate the problems our politics face. Let, let me uh, uh, add to that by going back to the genesis of this book. Uh, Tom and I have uh, been working together uh, on uh, analyzing and studying American politics, especially but not exclusively Congress. Uh, for 40 years, uh, even a little bit more. And uh, we've collaborated in a number of projects to try to both monitor and improve different elements of the political system, internally in Congress, election reform, uh, uh, problems with the permanent campaign and governance, campaign finance, ethics, and a whole series of other areas. And we've written a number of books together uh, on elements of this subject. The most recent before this one in 2006 uh, called The Broken Branch, How Congress is Failing America and How to Get It Back on Track. Uh, in that one, we lament a Congress that has gone off the rails, um, not doing any oversight, uh, not fulfilling its fundamental responsibilities. Um, we put a lot of blame on Republicans who took over uh, the reins of power while they had a president but behaved in a more supine fashion uh, instead of being an independent branch. But we also uh, faulted Democrats plenty for their uh, era in the majority. Um, six years passed. We did, a, in the meantime, an update uh, of the book after the Democrats recaptured control, saying that things were a little bit better, but uh, this was far from a, a cured branch. Uh, and then uh, an editor who had worked with us originally on The Broken Branch, called uh, and said, uh, don't you think it's time to uh, do something uh, that would uh, bring the political process up to date? And after some thought about whether we could uh, actually fit it in, given our time commitments, we both decided that we wanted to go ahead and do it, and do it on an expedited fashion, and drop a lot of other things, because we were increasingly alarmed at what had happened in the political process. Things that were bad in 2006, modestly but not wonderfully better in 2008, had taken a very serious turn for the worse. And uh, a Congress which at one point captured a 9% approval rating uh, showed that the American public uh, was at least as unhappy as we were and happened to be on target. So we wanted to do something that was broader than just looking at Congress, uh, that looked at the culture more generally uh, that had been corroded uh, and uh, uh, really uh, devastated uh, more broadly, but also in politics, uh, look at many different elements of the process, and that would pull no punches. And uh, that's the result that we got. It was not an easy book to write for us because uh, we have tried meticulously to be straightforward, cast blame where it belongs. But uh, we retain a lot of friends on both sides, and we're not seen as partisans in any way. We're still not. We haven't changed. But in this case, uh, saying where blame lay uh, meant putting a lot more of it on the Republican Party, uh, which we call in this book 
and insurgent outlier. Well, I think uh, implicit in your question is, uh, is a model of, uh, of crossfire. That is, the route to truth is, is, uh, is through the confrontation of opposing ideological uh, viewpoints. Uh, uh, we actually reject that and think that's a perverse aspect of our politics. Uh, uh, Norm and I disagree on, on, on matters uh, occasionally, uh, but we agree on much more. We were both trained at the University of Michigan. We have our PhDs from there. We, we came to Washington at the same time. We had a chance to work inside the Congress for a year. We're, we're, we're both deeply respectful of our constitutional system. We've spent a good deal of our careers explaining and defending uh, that system uh, and talking about the importance of uh, the first branch of, uh, of government. Well, I think it. I think it really does. And and to look to look for contrast is 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 probably to to sort of mischaracterize uh, who we are and what we do. We've we've worked together on a dozen projects uh, in the past. Uh, uh, it they've all tended to be how can we better understand how our political institutions are working and not working, and what are the avenues for improving those institutions. That's what characterizes us. I think it's also the case that Norm and I had each developed very unusual careers. We, we have one foot in Washington in the policy and political world, and the other foot in academe. Uh, uh, Norm has been a full-time professor. I've never had, but I was quite active in other ways in the in the scholarly community, and and so that's what's distinctive about our our partnership. Uh, I mean, if you look at our writings before we came together to collaborate, I probably wrote more on congressional elections uh, early on. That was that was my initial. Focus. Norm wrote more on on decision making within the Congress itself and the early reform movements. So we've, but I think on every chapter uh, in this book, uh, one of us took the lead in drafting part or all of it, and the other then rewrote it in in some ways. But you couldn't say, well, this is Norm's chapter and that's Tom's chapter. Let, let me uh, uh, offer a couple of uh, sort of twists on this. Uh, one is uh, this book got an enormous amount of resonance when it first came out, and uh, it was kind of amusing because there were a number of liberal blogs, left-wing blogs, uh, that complained that they'd been saying uh, similar things for years and nobody paid any attention. So how come now this gets attention? And I think uh, we believe a good part of the reason is that together we've spent 40 years building up capital as people who don't start with an ideological or a partisan uh, edge. And uh, saying this caught people's attention. So that's one part of it. The second part that makes the book distinctive uh, is not only that we provide some historical grounding and perspective, but also half the book is about where do we go from here. Uh, it starts with something that is not usually done in these cases, uh, which we call a chapter we call bromides to be avoided, things not to do. But then we go into some detail on a whole host of areas where changes might occur. Uh, it's easy to throw up your hands and say, uh, this is horrible or the end of the world is uh, coming. Um, it's harder to look at what you can do about it. Now, we do this with a uh, healthy dose of uh, reality and some skepticism. This is not something where there's a, a quick fix uh, or where there's some panacea. You can turn a switch and all is going to be better, partly because 
it's deeply embedded in the culture now. And what we have is a tribal politics where the country is divided into tribes. And in some ways, that's getting worse. The nature of this presidential election, uh, you know, here we are uh, in August. Uh, we're doing this right around the time of the Republican convention. And we now have uh, a couple of striking things uh, this week. Uh, one is uh, what uh, Romney uh, advisors are talking about much more openly, which is if the, while they're not abandoning the idea of focusing on the economy, they're turning to a sharper cultural attack on Obama, and that's going to provide uh, an even further division. We have a lot of political science research that shows that ads on welfare, for example, tap into racial resentments. And uh, if the ads themselves, as Ezra Klein of the Washington Post suggests, are not overtly uh, racial in nature, uh, they have that effect, and that's why they're running them. The second is a comment made by uh, the Romney pollster, uh, Neil Newhouse, um, which is just absolutely striking. Uh, as uh, he said, uh, our campaign is not going to be bound by fact checkers. Uh, so facts mean nothing now. And, uh, of course, it's been kind of amusing because uh, Governor Romney himself lamented what's happened and said, you know, if there are ads that fact checkers say are false, they should be taken off the air. But apparently that means their ads and not ours. If you live in a world and a culture where lying is celebrated, um, changing some of the structures uh, is uh, not going to be enough. It's, it sounds inviting to pick <laughs> up on, but I don't think that's, uh, that's the case uh, at all. Uh, neither of us is an ideologue, uh, but ideologues are driving our politics right now, so it isn't clear to me that the success the two of us might have coming together and working on this, uh, even though we come from two institutions that out there in the real world have a reputation uh, uh, as, as being divided ideologically. Uh, uh, in, in reality, uh, we don't well represent uh, the, the, the political world. Norm was talking about this before with the ads uh, running and, and the absence of truth value to much of what is what is being said, and his examples uh, came from the Republican side. That was not an accident. Uh, uh, one of the assertions in our volume is that the parties, while neither are angels, is an angel, uh, 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 differ really quite a bit on this. I mean, the, the respect for appreciation of facts, evidence, science, is, is much more rooted in the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. Um, uh, there is a contempt for, uh, for much of the scientific enterprise and really a contempt for what has evolved as our policy regime over a century, really going back to Teddy Roosevelt and a a determination to turn it around. There's a, a new interpretation of what the Constitution means, of how it was divinely inspired. Um, there are a whole, sort of whole host of uh, bits of uh, evidence that, that suggest in that respect, as well as in other respects, uh, the Republican Party today doesn't fulfill the expectation that we have about our two major parties that operate right of center and left of center, but basically in the mainstream of American politics. We, we don't have a conservative party anymore. We, we have a, a center left party and a radical party, and there's nothing conservative about uh, that radical Republican party. Yeah, I, that's, I think, a very key point. Our book is not a celebration of liberalism or even center-left politics, or even center-right politics. It's really a look at uh, and a lament at what's happened to problem-solving. 
You know, the Broken Branch, we dedicated to uh, two great uh, lawmakers, Barbara Conable, who was a quite conservative Republican from New York, and uh, Pat Moynihan, uh, who was an iconoclastic but basically liberal uh, Democrat uh, in the Senate from New York. And we dedicated to them because they were not only just wonderful human beings, but their goal in coming to public service was to solve problems, and that meant you looked to build coalitions, and you looked at facts, and you looked across lines. Uh, we uh, got a, a ringing endorsement of this book from Chuck Hagel uh, of Nebraska, a longtime senator who was a very conservative lawmaker. We've gotten a lot of praise from Mickey Edwards, uh, who served in the House for 16 years and was chairman of the American Conservative Union. We use, an, as an example, Bob Inglis, a very conservative uh, Republican from South Carolina who lost in a primary uh, because uh, he was not willing to say that Barack Obama was a socialist pig, um, but who's now gone out and formed an organization from a very distinctly free market viewpoint on what to do about climate change that starts with an understanding that it's a serious problem. And he's being vilified by a lot of people. The, the big difficulty that we have is, I think, twofold. One, it's become tribal. So it's not what the idea is, it's who's expressing it. And you see that very clearly in the uh, health care debate um, where uh, we have a Republican convention that is going to just slam Obamacare as socialism and a government takeover of health care um, when it is extremely close to what Romney has not only uh, uh, been behind in uh, Massachusetts, but now apparently is getting back uh, to uh, saying positive things about, along with a Republican alternative to the Clinton plan in uh, 1994. This is not a single-payer system or even a, a public option, so it's, it's because he's behind it. Uh, and at the same time, uh, if you are a problem solver, if your goal is to find solutions, and that means working across party lines, in today's Congressional Republican Party, and it's true in state legislatures in increasing fashion across the country, uh, you are uh, almost certain, first of all, to face a challenge in a primary, probably financed by the Club for Growth, uh, and you'll be vilified and ostracized. That's not the conservative Republican Party that we know from the days of Ronald Reagan uh, or uh, moving forward. It's a very different party, and Tom is, I think, spot on in saying this is not a conservative party. It's a radical one. I think there's something to that. I... Uh, both Norm and I have a problem with Lessig's argument that uh, money uh, determines everything, that it overwhelms every other factor. Uh, uh, Lessig actually downplays uh, uh, ideological differences, partisan differences. He believes that money is at the root driving all of this. and. Uh, and we think that's not the case. It's problematic. It reinforces some of the worst tendencies uh, in our politics. And, and in recent years, it, uh, it has uh, emerged in a, in a way that has allowed the Re Republican Party to, to really try to gain advantage, if you will, to build a majority in government when such a majority doesn't really exist uh, in the country. I'd, I'd say along with the ideological goals of an of a economic libertarianism, a, a social fundamentalism, uh, and a, a, a nationalistic, somewhat neoconservative uh, foreign policy, lies a uh, a belief in the use of any means to achieve that objective. And with demographic changes in our country increasingly leading to an electorate that now uh, uh, would be more sympathetic, uh, more interested in the Democratic uh, uh, Party, the growth of the non-white population, uh, certainly college 
uh, educated and graduate professional school, educated uh, the sort of professional class, the the non-married uh, women in uh, in in particular. Um, the idea is you sort of gather ye rosebuds while you may, and that means perhaps winning um, the last election based on almost entirely a, a white uh, a white electorate. Um, that means you want to depress uh, the vote on the other side that tends to be uh, to be non-white. Um, and you want to increase your turnout and the percentage of, say, working class whites that vote for you. And the best way to do that is to sort of stir up all of these attitudes is who's a real American? Um, so you become anti-immigrant. Um, uh, you you ap appeal to sort of racial uh, resentments and you... Uh, you you try to convince senior citizens that uh, those Democrats are really taking your programs, your Medicare, and giving that money to people who don't have the gumption and responsibility to carry their own weight, the undeserving poor, if you will. You know, I, 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 that's exactly right. Uh, but it's also important to emphasize, as Tom did, that the money system is now careening out of control and is having a series of extraordinarily deleterious impacts on our politics and our culture. Uh, the corruption levels are going to be much, much higher. And it's not just the money being spent, it's the threats that are there much more implicitly and explicitly now. Every lawmaker has to fear at this point that somebody could come in in the last two weeks of a campaign when you have no ability to raise the money to counter it and spend millions of dollars to destroy you. Uh, and that means if uh, there's a threat of doing that, uh, but you can avoid it if you vote for an amendment, uh, support a bill, um, you're going to be very tempted to do that, and not a dollar will have to be spent. Uh, that's a big problem. The pressure on the lawmakers to raise money, not just for themselves and their own campaign against a candidate, for their team, uh, because now it's pay to play. If you want to be a committee chair, you better raise money for your team. But now you've got to have a protective war chest just in case somebody comes in against you. And if you're going out there and raising the money, um, you're begging people for money. There's uh, either an implicit threat or a quid pro quo. And at the same time, what we're seeing in this campaign is this flood of outside money combined with the inside money that's designed in some ways to obfuscate uh, policy uh, debates and create a very different climate. So what we're going to see, for example, on the Medicare front is an attempt to have Americans saying, I can't figure this out. They're, they're both uh, probably to blame, and so uh, I'm just not even going to consider it. And what is in a very important policy area, and the gamble here is you pour enough money in uh, and ads that may be entirely false, and uh, people uh, are, are going to throw up their hands. That's not a great way to have a campaign. I think uh, when the uh, framers created the system, and it was a, supposed to be a deliberative system, a campaign, understanding that it's going to have all kinds of uh, harsh elements to it and uh, often hair-raising attacks, and they had them worse in the 19th century, uh, even at the end of the 18th century in many ways than we do now, personal vilification and the like. But the idea was you'd have a back and forth in a campaign that would end up with voters being able to make a choice uh, among parties and candidates. Now the intervention of this money has changed all of that. So uh, we don't uh, want to uh, be at one end of a scale while Lessig is at the other end of the scale. We view this through a different prism in terms of what the real uh, important dynamics are, but we don't in any way uh, dismiss or downplay the extraordinarily corrosive effect of the post-Citizens United uh, world uh, and also a world in which the Federal Election Commission has become almost literally lawless. Well, the filibuster is a, 
is a good example of that. Uh, nowhere does our Constitution provide for general supermajority vote requirements in the Senate. The framers anticipated the routine use of uh, majority votes and specified the cases where, like impeaching a president, uh, a supermajority would would be required. But accident of, uh, of history leaving out the uh, motion to proceed in the Senate's uh, rules uh, to clean them up uh, created the, an opportunity for individual senators to speak at length, to not relinquish the floor, even though a majority of senators were ready to act. That was used occasionally in the 19th century, but picked up uh, on some very important matters, in, including matters pertaining to the U.S. involvement in World War I. And Woodrow Wilson uh, put some pressure on. The Senate adopted a new rule uh, providing for cloture, that is a supermajority vote to cut off debate and proceed. Well, the Senate operated under that system, and filibusters occurred, but very occasionally. A couple a year uh, would, would be significant, um, but that really began to change. Uh, uh, initially, as the Senate calendar became filled and individual s senators had things they wanted to do or say, and so the norm of unanimous consent agreements built up. You got everyone's agreement <coughs> on how you would proceed, so there's predictability. But, but then over time, uh, all of the constraints in using this began to break down, first by individual senators, but then by the opposition party as a tactic to impose a threat to filibuster. And that's all that's required. You know, it is... It is the withholding of consent from unanimous consent agreement. If you do that, then the only way for the majority to proceed is to file a closure motion. So we don't have real filibusters anymore. We haven't had one in ages where a group of senators takes to the floor. All they need is one to say, I object. Uh, and this burdensome process of garnering uh, 60 votes, which is hard to do when the Parties are deeply polarized, and, and the majority doesn't have 60 dependable votes. Uh, Obama had it for a few months uh, uh, in, the, in the middle and end of his first year in office. Uh, they were 60, but not dependable. Uh, it made health reform possible, uh, but it, uh, it complicates the task of governing. So... Uh, you don't have to go through that process. It's such a potent weapon uh, that all you have to do is threaten it to uh, have it be effective. No, I, well, let me just say, uh, the, you know, the rule is the same as it's been since 1975. Uh, the difference is in a culture, and it's a culture where the uh, uh, in a previous era, not only was a filibuster re uh, reserved for a few issues of great national moment, uh, but the the two parties and the leaders uh, had their own agreement that you wouldn't disrupt governance uh, through the use or the threat of the use of a weapon of this sort. There would be individual rogue senators uh, who would do so, some on the left, some on the right, uh, but you had a general understanding that uh, governing the country and solving the problems took over. That's gone now. And Mitch McConnell made a deliberate decision to use the filibuster as a weapon of obstruction and to use it as leverage to gain other things. So you have the threat of filibuster, as you say, uh, employed in a way that it just wasn't before. Now, this is not all one-sided. Uh, in a process that began when the filibuster was changing in a more modest fashion uh, under then-majority leader Trent Lott, uh, but expanded under uh, Harry Reid, uh, there's been a counter-tool called filling the amendment tree. Uh, in effect, uh, 
preempting amendments from the minority so you can expedite matters, but also use that as a lever point or threat of, uh, of your own. The problem is uh, uh, doing this on both sides, and I think the bigger issue has been the misuse of the filibuster per se uh, by the minority, but this is not a good way to govern. This is a good way to illustrate a fundamental uh, argument of our book, uh, which is the mismatch between the political parties today, both the extent of their polarization, but the culture under which they operate and our constitutional system of separation of powers and bicameralism and the rest. Uh, Norm was talking about Mitch McConnell playing hardball, you know, with the threats of filibuster and the vehement opposition to everything and demon. It sounds like a parliamentary system. If if he were the leader of an opposition in a in a in a parliament, you'd say, well, of course, that's what oppositions do. But when push comes to shove, the government has a majority in its own party or in a coalition of parties to put their program into effect, enact it into law, implement it, and then eventually be held accountable. But in our system, if, if the minority party is willing to use that tool on a consistent basis, it can damage what the majority is trying to put in place and then turn around and blame the majority's program for being ineffective. Uh, that sort of leads to a real problem of democratic accountability. What's a voter to do? Who do they hold responsible uh, uh, when things aren't going well? In some respects now, they've, they've come to, say, a pox on both your houses. Both parties are rated very low by by the electorate, Republicans lower even than Democrats, but the president uh, is the most visible figure and symbol of leadership in the public. So it, it's him and his party that tend to, to uh, suffer uh, the most, even if uh, they haven't had a clean shot at putting their program into effect. I think it's uh, it's right for now. Uh, you know that doesn't mean it has to always be that way, and it's not just a switch that got turned on in 2009. As we point out, some of the roots of this go back to Newt Gingrich uh, and uh, his crusade for 16 years to uh, break the Democratic Party's stranglehold on power in the House, which ended up lasting for 40 years, but also. Um, a tactic that he employed when Bill Clinton became president, uh, which was to get his party united as a uh, parliamentary minority, voting against everything uh, and discredit and uh, delegitimize the Clinton presidency. And it worked like a charm in 1994 in the midterm elections. And now it was used again uh, with the new tools of communication and social networks and a much greater determination to delegitimize in 2009 and 2010 and into 2011. And if you combine that with a growing uh, ideological uh, extremism in Republican ranks, uh, it's a very different party, and we offer a lot of data to suggest this isn't just impressionistic. Those things have changed, and they've uh, degraded the whole idea of problem solving for the greater good. Uh, it's the next election, and it's putting party ahead of country. And that's different than what we have seen in most of our lifetimes. But I think it's important to say, I agree with what Norm said, but uh, we have gone through periods in our history that yeah. were not entirely dissimilar. The, uh, some of the newer historiography on the period around uh, the War of 1812 suggests deep partisan divisions. Uh, of course, the lead up to the Civil War was a was a period of extraordinary polarization over the issue of uh, of slavery, uh, and the post Reconstruction uh, period, late nineteenth, early twentieth century, saw another set of issues divide the parties, produce deep differences, and and some real problematics in in, in governing. The problem is when we use the pre-Civil War example, people say, 
Yeah, but look how that was resolved. It was a bloody uh, resolution. And, and at times, you know, the, the sort of the ugliness, just not just incivility, but the, the seemingly sort of genuine feelings of you're not a real American, uh, a sort of anger that this is socialism, this is someone else, uh, uh, worries one that we're not doing what the framers had in mind, which was to peacefully resolve our differences in a set of uh, 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 deliberations uh, involving people representing different interests and having a different set of, uh, of values. Uh, we've encountered it before it's back, it's back severely, and, and in many respects, it's, it's, it's being justified uh, as, uh, as the new norm, and, uh, and I don't mean Ornstein. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's it's become uh, sharper and more direct and obvious in the in the 2012 campaign, um, and I think that's uh, because uh, Governor Romney and the people around him um, don't believe that they can win using uh, uh, what they had hoped to before, which is the economy, the economy, the economy. It's a referendum on the economy, um, but there's nothing new about that either. And I think there are a few things you could say. One is. Race is never far from the surface in society uh, or in American politics, one. But, two, if you look at the things that were said about Bill Clinton when he became president and throughout his presidency, the active attempts to delegitimize him, uh, including a series of Wall Street Journal editorials that uh, hinted at the idea that he was an accessory to murder uh, when he was governor of Arkansas, um, really tells you that the blood sport that Vince Foster sadly wrote about uh, was there. The attempt to build not a broad coalition, but the narrowest one possible, was Karl Rove's strategy in both uh, 2000 and 2004. Rove now is trying to rewrite that history, but there's little doubt that he saw the way to victory in 2004 was uh, to get 50.1 percent with Republicans and a few stray others if you could get them, but it wasn't an attempt to try and find the broad ground in the center. It was an attempt to keep it at one end. And, you know, the fact is both parties have uh, their uh, tough leaders uh, and strategists who are going to use whatever tactics they uh, can, but in this case, Race is a part of this, and it's a dangerous game to play, not only because it uh, adds to the tribal elements here, um, but uh, to look at the larger focus as, that you've suggested, and it's not just race. We have greater uh, economic inequality in the country than uh, we have had uh, in the last century or even more. We are now on a par with Juan Perón's Argentina, and uh, it's growing worse. And that is not a formula for long-term stability uh, and satisfaction in a society. And if you play on those divisions, and, and in particular, if you want to pursue policies that are going to heighten the inequality, um, you're going to reap the whirlwind, and that's a real danger here. Just uh, if I could add a word to that, there's, there's some very interesting scholarship uh, uh, that's been done that's shows a very close relationship over time with the level of economic inequality and the level of partisan polarization. Uh, it also turns out that the sort of number and visibility of immigrants uh, relates to this as well. So it, it, ironically, it, 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 it turns out that in, in times of economic inequality, the squeeze on the middle class, working class, uh, uh, tends to lead to resentments. And the resentments get sometimes directed upwards to the moguls, uh, 
the billionaires, but just as often gets directed at those who aren't like us. They could be immigrants from Europe uh, in an earlier uh, era, uh, or they could be blacks or Hispanics or, or someone else. But the anti-immigrant sentiment coincides with the, the racial dimension and the economic inequality to, to produce a volatile uh, mix of, uh, of, of very strong uh, opinions and uh, resentments that, uh, that fuel the polarization going on, and you end up getting very strange uh, coalitions. Who would, who would have thought that the Republicans' two major constituent groups, and this is the party of business, uh, are evangelical Christians and white working class uh, Americans. That, that's the, the core of their, uh, of their vote, if not their financial support. Uh, listen, if you go back historically, the d Democrats have no reputation for fiscal probity. In fact, the Republicans were the green eyeshade party, while Democrats were trying to grow government and uh, oftentimes uh, not too much concerned with whether, uh, whether the books balance. But, but this really began to change in the late 70s, the Prop 13 in California, anti-tax movement sort of resentment. And, and really led to a transformation of the Republican Party from one of fiscal probity and, and what we consider to be, quote, conservative to a party that was dedicated toward cutting taxes primarily. Uh, Jack Kemp, who was one of the champions of this policy, was never much concerned about spending. I mean, come on, spend. Uh, 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 that's no problem. It'll do good things and get the economy running. And, and, and that sort of carried on. So ironically, Republicans in government controlling the White House have shown little concern for balancing the books, while Democrats, and they don't care if government goes bankrupt because they don't like government. And uh, Democrats, on the other hand, wanting a a resource there, whether it's for social safety net or pumping up uh, infrastructure spending or whatever, just realize if things get completely out of, uh, out of balance, there will be no room to maintain, much less increase these programs. So Bill Clinton led uh, and uh, had a remarkable success uh, in doing that. And and George Bush came into office, and his first move was to, uh, to cut taxes. And when it came to spending um, for the wars and even an expansion of uh, Medicare with the prescription drugs, there wasn't any concern about paying for it all. Now, ironically, Republicans are saying, well, Mr. Obama is a big spender, and he's given us all these deficits. Well, that's not where the deficits, uh, deficits came from. And you can see the dynamic is the same, because Paul Ryan's plan and Mitt Romney's economic plan for reviving the economy and solving the deficit problem is to cut taxes, uh, not just extending the Bush tax cuts, but uh, going well, uh, well beyond that and having a asterisk as to how it will be compensated for by, by other things. So it's a radical restructuring of government assistance, especially for lower income families, the Medicaid, food stamps, uh, uh, and other governmental uh, activities, uh, uh, and lowering taxes. It, uh, it's, it's almost uh, uh, by necessity, Democrats who like spending, uh, who who created Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and and uh, and now uh, uh, health insurance through the Affordable Care Act, now feel obliged to figure out a way to pay for it because they know otherwise it will all 
all collapse. So they're the party with the incentive to be fiscally responsible now. You know, you, it's an interesting question. Of course, we start the book uh, by talking about the debt limit debacle. Um, and, you know, we've had uh, several dozen of votes on the debt limit uh, in the last 50 years. Um, and both parties have been utter hypocrites uh, in uh, carrying them out. Uh, you have lots of members when they're, uh, uh, the other party holds the presidency who vote against increasing the debt limit because they want to look like they're the fiscal guardians. And then they turn around and uh, uh, behave in exactly the opposite fashion when their party holds the White House. Uh, but what we've always seen in the past with both parties is that the leaders and many of the followers understood that in the end, you can play these political games. That's part of what happens in a democracy. But you're not going to endanger the full faith and credit of the United States. So the leaders had votes in reserve. Members could vote against the, uh, raising the debt limit to protect themselves against attack ads. But if you needed them, you would get them. This was the first time that you actually had the debt uh, limit taken as a hostage. And after it was over, Mitch McConnell said, uh, some of my colleagues thought that this was a hostage uh, worth killing. What we've learned is it's a hostage worth taking. And now we've got uh, Speaker Boehner, who in his uh, almost first act as Speaker-elect warned his colleagues that now that they were going to be in the majority and that shared some of the responsibility, they'd have to behave like grown-ups, and that included things like uh, the responsibility for the debt limit. Now he's leading the charge to hold the debt limit hostage again. So it's an interesting question. If Democrats are uh, in the minority and it's a Mitt Romney presidency, would they do the same thing? I don't think so, uh, in part because I think you don't have the kinds of radicals like a Jason Chaffetz who said, uh, would we have brought it all down? You bet we would have. And uh, the Michelle Bachmans who think that it would have been good. And uh, I was at a, uh, a session at the Bipartisan Policy Center a few weeks ago uh, talking about uh, these issues, and um, a uh, longtime conservative Republican uh, who had been uh, staff director for a budget committee for many years said that when he was up on the Hill cautioning uh, the Republicans uh, that this was a crazy thing to do, uh, said he had one member uh, say to him, you know what, if we take our stand and bring the debt limit down, it will uh, improve America's credit rating. And he looked at him and said, do you understand what a AAA rating is? Uh, you can't improve the credit rating. And he had no idea what he was talking about. You know, you've got ignoramuses on both sides, but I don't think you'd have it. The danger here, however, is that the longer you go with a party acting in an irresponsible fashion, the more you're going to build in the likelihood of a counter-reaction. The more you have Democrats who say, well, look, let's try and work things out. And we've had many instances, David Price, a, a great political scientist and a terrific member of Congress on the Appropriations Committee in the House, tells all the time about working out bills in the subcommittee and appropriations where both parties are deeply engaged and they reached out and they take their ideas and they put together a thoroughly bipartisan bill. And when it gets to the floor, all the Republicans vote against their own bill. Um, how long are you going to do that? Uh, there was a piece by Bill Keller in the New York Times a couple of days ago about Ron Wyden, who's now viewed with great uh, suspicion and some disdain on his own party for having given an imprimatur to Paul Ryan on the Medicare issue. But uh, Wyden has, for a long time, gone way out of his way to try and build uh, bipartisan policy uh, positions with unlikely conservative legislators. The point of Keller's piece at the end was uh, he may have made a mistake in this case, whatever it may be. Um, people like uh, Wyden are uh, potentially a vanishing breed because how long are you going to do this if you end up being betrayed by the guy who you work your deal with and then vilified by your own party for doing it? So there's a danger here that this polarization could lead us into even worse territory. And if we go through a cycle of uh, uh, changes in government where the uh, uh, party that doesn't hold the presidency uh, immediately resumes a role of throwing grenades into the tent, uh, we're all going to get damaged.
I think uh, the Ryan blueprint is is pretty clear on this. It uh, it it really uh, leads us into an era in which tax revenues for the federal government are are south of 15 percent of GDP instead of north of 20 percent when the main social safety net programs are changed from defined benefit to defined contribution which which means if you the primary route to uh, dealing with uh, increasing health care costs, which, which are just untenable, have to be dealt with, is, is cost shifting uh, to someone else, where you reduce over a couple of decades the Medicaid program by 75% by turning it into a, a block grant with caps uh, to the states, then either the states are forced to pick it up or more likely you just com you just reduce um, the level of activity for those people and remember a good a good share of uh, Medicaid expenses go to uh, <coughs> older people who've spent out all their money and have to be in a in a nursing home so and where you have defense interest payments um, your your vouchers for Medicare, your block grants for Medicaid, um, and then the room for the rest of government, everything else that you can think of doing, uh, air traffic control, food safety, uh, infrastructure, education at the, at the federal level is reduced to 1% of GDP or less. I mean, it, it, uh, there is no room for anything else. So it really is... Uh, if you will, a, a repeal of uh, the last century of, uh, of social and economic policy. It's a, it, 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 in, in many respects, Paul Ryan took Ayn Rand very seriously, and, and uh, he trims it. Uh, he ignores the, the religious side of it. Ayn Rand was an atheist and uh, wouldn't take cater much to Paul Ryan's strong uh, religious commitment and belief, but the rest uh, he'd really go with. So that is the objective. No, and I, I think that's exactly right. And it's not just to take the country back before the New Deal, although uh, I think a lot of Paul Ryan and others would view the New Deal as a, you know, a terrible development uh, for freedom in America. But it is to take it back before the year of Teddy Roosevelt, too. Right. Um, it's remove all of those regulatory uh, impediments uh, that uh, Roosevelt brought in. Uh, it's, a, it's a set of radical goals in a lot of ways using radical means. And if there's a model for them now, it's Scott Walker uh, in Wisconsin. It is uh, once you get elected, even if it's by a narrow margin, you muster your forces, you build in the same unity in the majority that you had in the minority, you enact radical policies, and then you lash yourself to the mast and believe that once they take effect and freedom reigns, then people will breathe that freedom for the first time. And if it takes a while for them to have their lungs react to it, uh, they will soon be blessing you for it. In the meantime, you build in as many uh, ways as you can to preserve power long enough to keep it from being reversed. And so, uh, of course, the Walker plan was to cut the pins out from under the base of support for the Democratic Party by uh, devastating uh, the public employee unions. You'd see that even more at a national level uh, if they took power. And at the same time, we see in a number of states uh, the voter suppression measures, not just voter ID laws, but attempts to cut out early voting where it would benefit uh, Democrats to uh, cut out voters uh, who might uh, otherwise go for Democrats uh, by purging uh, voter rolls uh, pretty indiscriminately uh, when it comes to citizens versus non-citizens, and a host of other ways. And my guess is you'd see that at the national level as well, a little bit more of a backwater. Uh, it's a grand experiment if it happens, and uh, Paul Ryan talked about it long before he was chosen to be a running mate and talked about how if they took all the reins of power, they would put uh, together the mother of all reconciliation bills using that technique 
that was used for the Bush tax cuts, as it was used for the Children's Health Insurance Program, as it was used for the Affordable Care Act, but in this case going way beyond them to implement this radical vision and, uh, and avoid a filibuster in the Senate. Uh, and uh, if they win the Senate, even by, the, by a narrow margin, win the House and win the White House, whether Mitt Romney wants it or not, that's the bill that will be sent to him, uh, and uh, he will, of course, uh, sign it. And my guess is that if they can't do it all fully in that fashion, and they would put enormous pressure on uh, the parliamentarians in the House and Senate, uh, enormous pressure on the head of the Congressional Budget Office to make sure that uh, they could uh, get the rules to work to their advantage. But if it wasn't enough, then you might see the filibuster uh, either eliminated or brushed aside, uh, believing that there's a narrow window of opportunity to do this radical stuff. The only element I'd add to, to that, uh, the means, is where the money comes back in as well. We discussed that earlier. Uh, but the Republicans, through the so-called super PACs and their affiliated nonprofit organizations, uh, uh, have gotten a sort of tremendous jump. Uh, uh, the press usually talks about this as outside funding. Nothing outside about it. Look at each of those organizations. These are run by party operatives uh, who've been very active working with the parties and their candidates. At, uh, uh, Karl Rove sort of is chair of a coalition of these groups. They meet regularly with their presidents and presidential candidates. Uh, uh, sort of democratic billionaires like, like Soros uh, are appalled by that role. They played this game back in 2004 differently in a more constrained way, and uh, they didn't like it one bit. Uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Adelson and uh, Mr. Ricketts and a whole host of, uh, uh, of, of other very wealthy conservatives are perfectly happy to write checks for 10 or 25 or 50 or a hundred million dollars, and that soon becomes uh, real money, uh, and is certainly part of the political strategy of gaining and retaining power in order to advance what we've described as a uh, radical agenda. I would say we're, we're both hopeful in some ways. It is an inflection point. Um, it, it would be a very interesting challenge. Let's say the Senate is 50-50, and uh, we get this radical reconciliation bill. Uh, you're going to find three or four Republican senators uh, who would be appalled by it. Whether any of them would be willing to accept the incredible uh, not only pressure, but threats that would come if they stood in the way after they'd finally attained that power would be uh, interesting. But it's possible, uh, at least, that one or two of them would. Um, at the same time, if uh, President Obama wins re-election and Republicans realize they've got four more years with him, uh, you're going to have a number of Republican senators who are tired of voting no on everything, and you'll probably find coalitions in the Senate. That I would describe as hopeful. But also, to be realistic, we have two examples uh, this last couple of months where we had uh, three-fourths of the Senate come together in a broad bipartisan way on the transportation bill, a badly needed crumbling infrastructure, on a farm bill in the midst of this horrific drought, uh, and with a broken uh, farm subsidy system. And uh, both bills went to the House, and the transportation bill sat there uh, through a critical uh, uh, construction season and uh, while well, huge problems ensued with the House not paying any attention to what uh, their uh, Republican counterparts did in the Senate. And uh, we have seen nothing done on the farm bill, even as uh, livestock farmers are being devastated by this. So I'm not terribly hopeful in the short run about the House. We are hopeful over a longer period of time. The examples that Tom cited period around the War of 1812, the Civil War, uh, the 1890s, 
it was, those were cycles that took about a decade or so to get out of. The last one was a Democratic Party that veered off uh, the rails. Um, so I think we come back eventually. Uh, what um, makes me very uneasy is um, a decade now is a very long time, given the immediate challenges facing the country in a, in a tough economic and political world. The question is whether the the new status quo on January 1 of uh, 2013 with the so-called fiscal cliff, the expiration of the tax cuts and uh, sequestration of defense and discretionary domestic spending uh, changes the political dynamic. Let's say if Obama's elected but Republicans still control the House, uh, it, it turns out just stopping something isn't satisfactory uh, anymore because, because taxes will be higher than they are now by, by quite a, a large amount. So Republicans will need affirmative steps uh, to cut taxes, but without the agreement of, uh, of uh, President Obama, they can't get them. So they're forced into a negotiating mode that they haven't been in during this period of time, and, and that might, you know, with the global pressures uh, in the global economy and the new status quo from which they're operating, that could create some beginnings of, uh, of negotiations with, with some Republicans in both the Senate and the House whose instinct is more toward problem solving than than ideology advancing. Uh, so that's possible, but um, it's just as possible that we're, if Romney's elected with a Republican Congress, we, we could get a dramatic change in policy and, and then a stunning reversal in the next midterm election or the following presidential election so that there's a new status quo, but a a, a political majority that's deeply opposed to it and, and continue on with the kind of battles that, that ensue. Um, uh, that's why two of our chapters are in the book are really devoted to looking over the long run of, of trying to see if it isn't possible to temper the, the extreme partisanship and polarization of the parties through extensions of the franchise and we toy with ideas like mandatory attendance at the polls but we also look at other other reforms of the of the voting administration but also the electoral system um, the things that can be done to change the 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 nature of those who participate say in primary elections uh, 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 and where you can build in a kind of form of preferential voting so you, you, uh, you don't have third parties either discouraged but, or put in a position of influencing the outcome of an election that denies the majority the choice they would uh, like. So I think, I think it's important to work on, on both fronts, the immediate situation, trying to clarify What's going on here, and why we have the dysfunction? What, you know, in the in the end, you've got to reach voters, but sadly, the voters you need to reach are those who are not already committed to the parties, and those swing voters are the least engaged, least informed, least looking <coughs> for such information. But I have to say, we come down pretty hard, uh, not just on the partisan media but on the mainstream media, they have cowered in the face of, of charges of partisan bias uh, or ideological bias, and they've come to take the safe route, uh, saying, oh, they're equally imp implicated, or give a voice to one on the left and one on the right and, and step back from, from really getting at the truth. This is, this is so evident now in... in in this Congress, uh, in particular, where there was a lot of reluctance to, to, to speak forthrightly about the reckless move that was to take the debt ceiling hostage and 
We're seeing it in the campaign uh, as well. And we see it in the commercial channels. We see it in public uh, broadcasting. Everyone's sort of kind of wary of being charged with uh, bias. That's why we were quite explicit about our analysis, as a, and that's perhaps helped us get the attention that we've been able to get. If you read that carefully, we offer that as a solution, but uh, one that we're not very attracted to. That is to say, we're not ready to undermine uh, separation of powers. We're not attract the idea of weakening the Congress. We're not uh, uh, excited about the prospect of removing important decisions from elected officials, but we do think some degree of, uh, of, uh, of some distance on some matters, like the base closing commission, in this case, probably the most important is the is is the uh, the new board set up to uh, to try to control health care costs? It uh, it's weak the way it was set up because of opposition, but it needs to be strengthened. We have to introduce some elements of those without denying the ultimate authority of Congress uh, and the president to act on the basis of their election legitimacy. Uh, I, I, exactly so. We, uh, we don't want a parliamentary system, uh, but we suggest that we may have to tilt a little bit if we can't break the deadlock uh, where we are now towards providing a little bit more authority for the executive. We explore other options, but our strong, strong, strong preference is to keep the institutions the way the framers designed them and simply have them work uh, with uh, uh, political figures who understand that the goal is to work with others, uh, find some common ground, and solve problems.